We're here with John Broughton. How are we doing today, man? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. What have you been doing since the whole pandemic caused the world to crash? Um, well, sports all got canceled, so that kind of sucked. March was going to be really, really fun. I was going to go and film a lot of wrestling and then um, pretty much snap of the fingers uh, a day later and it was all different. And, um, you know, everything got canceled and then it's just been adjusting to working inside and not getting my hair cut and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all the all the limitations. But I think I've hit a bit of a stride just spending this time to, uh, well, listen to some audio books and, and get some self-education. In. Have you thought about dabbling and cutting your hair yourself? <laughs> um, well, actually, today I've got a haircut later on. Um, because the barber shop's finally open again. Um, nice. So that's nice. Yeah. Nice. But it was almost like getting to the point where I needed to just bust it all off or something. <laughs> For sure. What um, events did you have like scheduled to make videos for? Um, well, I had D3 Nationals, D1 Nationals, and then... Um, and man, we were at D3 Nationals. We were like warming up, you know what I mean? Like I was giving pep talks to my guys and and on the team and, and saying, you know, nobody beats you. No one's better than you here. And then they didn't even get the chance to compete, which was heartbreaking. But then um, D1 Nationals and then tentative, well, not tentative, but like we were pretty sure that we were going to make it happen for the Olympic trials. So that was a big one that um, sucks that that didn't happen. Yeah. So for those that don't know, um, John, he is kind of famous in the wrestling world for two main reasons, I'd say. Um, one is he runs a wrestling meme page with over 100,000 followers. Um, I'm sure you're very proud of that, <laughs> and you love hearing it's, people talk about it. It's weird. It's weird because I, I forget I have it sometimes, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> And then he also makes a bunch of dope videos for track wrestling um, of like the world level tournaments, NCAA tournaments, all sorts of stuff. And, yeah, and the sorry, go on. Oh no, I was just gonna say it's it's a it's a really fun job, and um, I'm really lucky to have such great clients to work for. Um, you know, my college, University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and uh, Army West Point. Um, are also in that they give me a lot of uh, jobs and they're really really fun to work with too nice and then um i was going to mention like you're also kind of ben askren's go-to guy for all things video so <laughs> yeah i actually was filming with him yesterday he was playing disc golf with the best <laughs> disc golfer in the world he loves disc golf it's so awesome uh and he's got a course around his house which is so cool and uh, he just put his Prius on one of the holes. So like, if you hit the back bumper of the Prius, the, the disc is like right next to the hole, which is awesome. And uh, yeah, Ben is, uh, he's in Wisconsin, right? So he's, he's fairly close to where I went to school and now where I live. And um, one of my teammates, Jordan Newman, was like his, one of his practice partners for getting ready for his UFC run. and. Um, one of his main like protégés, I'd say, and like one of the coaches that coaches at uh, one of his academies. And so uh, working with Jordan a little bit and giving him some video content, Ben kind of saw what I was doing. And then he posted a, um, a uh, something on Facebook about how he's looking for a videographer. And I just had his number and I just texted him. I said, don't hire anyone else hire me. I'll be there tomorrow. Let's talk about it. And, uh, and yeah, we worked together for a whole year now. Uh, it was last May that I started working with him and it's, it's been awesome. That's super cool. I'm sure there's yeah. tons of people that are jealous cause that's, that's awesome. But um, yeah, there were, there were a couple moments where I was like, this is the coolest thing. Like I could not put myself in a, in a better situation right now. Just like experience wise and just having fun time in my life it was it was an awesome year for sure nice so kind of would you say like what started it all the whole like just 
getting into like the wrestling media stuff is the meme page like was that the first thing i guess um well okay i remember i was a senior in high school and i'm really big on like would you focus on like we can only focus on a certain amount right so you focus on like your world kind of builds around that so if you focus on wrestling you're able to see the whole like wrestling world right and you're able to see opportunities in the wrestling world and you're able to see you know different things um because that's your focus right whereas if your focus was some other sport or some other thing your world would build around that um so when i was a senior in high school you know i decided i was gonna wrestle in college and um there was a shoe account that had like less than two thousand followers maybe it was like just two thousand followers and um, the guy I followed, it was like called Wrestling Shoe Swag. <laughs> and um, okay. and uh, he said he was selling the account. And I like DM'd him. I was like, how much? He's like, well, I have an offer for $40. And I was like, I'll pay 50 So, oh. <laughs> I, so I, I paid him like $50, like um, some like PayPal. We didn't have Venmo back then. But um, and then I didn't know what I was going to do with it. But I was like, I have 2,000 Instagram followers that's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a big deal to me. So then I was like, okay, so what do I do? And I thought about posting shoes. I just got in a pair of like those yellow inflicts. And I was like, okay, um, no, I don't really want to post shoes. That seems like time consuming and boring. And then I posted a wrestling meme that just, I, I thought of like a joke. Right. And everyone liked it. And I was like, all right. And then I thought about it a little bit. I posted another one. Everyone liked that one. I was like, all right, this is what I'm doing. So then I just start, kept posting. And when you're involved in the world of wrestling as an athlete and you're like following a bunch of wrestling pages and you're always thinking about wrestling, it's like, it's easy to come up with jokes about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, as you know from running your beam page, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and, and I just kept doing that and kept posting. And back then there weren't like, good wrestling meme pages like there are now like now there's like a lot right but yeah. back then it was it was just me and then maybe one or two other ones that didn't really post consistently or weren't weren't funny so i was like all right if i post every single day this thing will grow and then it did and then before i know it um i think within like six months i went from two thousand to ten thousand followers and then from and then it just kept to growing and growing and growing and then i was like okay i could get this to 100,000 followers and i could just keep you know pushing and stuff but now it's like it's great i love it i post on it sometimes but i do forget about it because my focus is much more on my business and video production and stuff like that so i kind of miss out on a lot of good opportunities for jokes i'd say and uh keeping the pages relevant and alive as I, um, as I should be. Um, but to go back to your question, I don't, it, the, it didn't really like start my video production. My video production had been going on since like I was in seventh grade. I was making like football highlight videos and then I was making, um, recruiting highlight videos for the seniors when I was like a freshman and they were all sending like my tapes, like the tapes that I had edited of them playing sports. Right. Um, to colleges and they were getting these scholarships and I was like oh this is awesome and I was making like okay money for high school high schooler doing that oh and so you're so, making um, money doing that back then yeah yeah okay. yeah so I take all their huddle highlights I download them all and I make them a video and then in my own time I was doing like Notre Dame football was my favorite now I don't even watch the games but um <laughs> but I was like I love Notre Dame football as a middle schooler and and high schoolers so I did highlights of them every week and uh and I just got better and better at editing but I wasn't ever shooting so then when I tore my shoulder after my sophomore wrestling season in college I was like oh dude what do I do with all this time and energy so I just threw it into getting better at, at filming and editing um and then that's pretty much where my really serious business started you know what i mean mm -hmm. is that like when did you reach out to ben uh so ben i had been 
let's see here. It was last May. So I'd already been working for track for okay. over a year and I'd already been working with uh, army West point for over a year. So it was, um, it was after all that. Okay. So, um, I guess who was like the first, what was like the first bigger job in wrestling that was like super cool for you? Oh, so then, so I actually, you know how like actors are always talking about like their big break, quote mm-hmm. unquote, right? Um, this was my big break was uh, the World Cup. It was in Iowa and track had the rights to, to film the live matches and stuff like that and repost it. And I came to work for track where we were at D3 Nationals and I've been doing f- video for Wisconsin Whitewater uh, all, all season. And I'd gotten better and better. And I was like, okay, I've gotten like pretty good at this. Like this is something I could give to a, a bigger company, a bigger, you know, expand my, uh, my client base. Right. And mm-hmm. uh, I was at D3 Nationals. And I showed Andy Hamilton, who was one of the main guys at track wrestling, um, my videos. And he was like, dude, this is awesome. And I showed Shane Sparks and he was like, this is awesome, John. I'm like, this is great. But I don't think they like really – got it yet and i was like well i'd love to do this for you and they're like yeah we could do that but it was like uh oh yeah maybe and then i said well okay who's filming your finals highlight and they're like oh we just take the clips from the stream and we edit it together the best takedowns and all that and i was like okay let me shoot and edit your finals highlight and i'll give it to you for free right and they're like oh but you do that i was like oh of course knowing that if they had seen like that the production quality right and they liked mm-hmm. it and it got him excited um that they would jump on it and i'd get hired to do more jobs so i gave him the d3 highlight video and then d1s was a week later and they called me up and they're like we love the video we loved it so much can you be you know in um i think it was pittsburgh or cleveland i can't remember one of the two for d1s the next week and i was like oh my god this is this is crazy and, and that was like my first like little break. And then I did a couple jobs for them. And then they're like, Hey, the world cups in Iowa this weekend, or, you know, this next week, right? Like, can you do it? And I was like, absolutely. I can do it. You know, like what, what could be better than doing that? Uh, so I filmed it. And then I remember like thinking like, okay, that was like a huge step like that. I just crossed a new threshold. Like I'm on a different level now. Um, not like, not like there's, you know, much difference in the way I do things or anything like that, but that was just such a huge opportunity that I, I feel like I had capitalized on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, like, what is it like being around people that you've seen on TV for years and now get to kind of know on a personal level? Um, I get, uh, at the beginning, I got a little nervous, right? Because I was like, oh, dude, like, I remember watching David Taylor's dresser dump and being like, I've got to do exactly that way, right? And then it (laughs) saved my neck at state because I hit it and then it became one of my best moves. But I remember, like, just having a regular conversation with David and he would be, he was, like, telling uh, his wife, he was like, he's like, Kendra, Kendra, he's like, this is the guy that made the World Cup highlight. I was like, oh my God, like that's just all the validation I needed to feel like I belong there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it became less and less weird, but um, working for Vector Wrestling, they run a bunch of camps and they've got like the best clinicians. They're one of my favorite clients. And they bring all of these guys that, like you said, the, the people you've seen on TV, the Daringers, Dake, Taylor, Burroughs, all these guys, right? Um, Bryce Meredith I I mean I could go on and on Bo Nickel and and they bring all these clinicians in and you get to like spend the whole day with them and get lunch with them and you're um I'm like filming them the whole time so I'm like right next to them so you know you have these little back and forth interactions and before you know it you're like pretty good friends with the guy and then uh you know you you keep up with them uh on social media and this and that and then they see you at events and it's cool it's it at first I was a little nervous but then it was like okay, this is, they're, you know, they're wrestlers. You've talked to wrestlers before, you know, they're just, we're cut from the same cloth. You know what I mean? 
Who is the most unique person you've gotten to know through your experiences? Like unique wrestler. That's a good question. Unique. I'd say it's pretty hard to, I'd say it's pretty hard to put like Ben Askren in a category. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's fair. He's so he's, he's, he's funky, right? But Ben is like such a great life example. I mean, if you look at him he's like, he's like, yeah, um, I'm not going to do what everyone else is doing. You know what I mean? I'm going to do my thing because I see that it's a better way or mm, I know everyone's doing that, but I'm going to do this. And then you look at just the way that he is in his business and the way that he is um, at marketing himself. Um, pretty much everything that he does like um, is remarkable, you know? And uh, I actually just read this audio book, well, read this audio book, listen to, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. um, and it's called the purple cow. And then basically it's about, in business or in life, if you're remarkable, you're going to get a lot of haters and a lot of, um, you know, criticism, but that really just adds to your credibility because it means that you're doing something worth remarking about. Um, and I think that you see that a lot with Ben. Ben has a, like a lot of haters. Um, but it's also just the fact that he's doing something remarkable and, and a lot of people are kind of remarking on it, right? Positive or negative. So yeah, I'd say he's the most unique and uh, man, he invented scrambling. So like <laughs> him and, and Mike Ironman. So how, how could you, how could you put him in any box? Right? Yeah. Yeah. I started listening to him probably like three or four years ago. I listened to his podcast, the to your own funky show. Great podcast. <laughs> RIP. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Dude, he's so, he's so intelligent too. That comes through on the podcast. Yeah. He just kind of like, I don't know, like everything he says makes sense. And it's not always like the most like orthodox stuff. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of expands your viewpoint on things. So it's cool to listen to. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes from, dude, his bookshelf is stacked. He's read a ton of books. He's So he's got a ton of perspective on different things in the way that different people think and the way that different people act and, um, you know, just has a really good handle on the way that the world works. And, um, and it's, it's really interesting to see, cause he does, he, every once in a while will say something that changes, like the way you think about something and you're like, Oh, I never really thought about it that way. Um, so those are always cool to see. And it's really respectable how he like, he doesn't really give a crap about what people say about him or like, he does a good job at dealing with the hate and he's like, okay with, making fun of himself and then yeah he doesn't, he doesn't take life too seriously no he doesn't and he um there's a have you seen his documentary on flow the funk mm -hmm. multiple times yeah it's a good one right it is. there's uh there's one part where he's um coach smith is, is talking about him and he's like yeah he was like joking around before the finals like you know like um just messing around and and just being funny right and he's like, hey, Ben, like, let's try and be a little serious. And he was like, coach, I got this. <laughs> and, um, you know, that that whole, like, laid back, I know I'm more prepared. Something he says a lot is, or I've heard him say a couple times at least, is if something adverse happens, right, you guys run into some type of adversity, it's going to affect the other fighter more than it affects him because he's more stable. That's way he, the way he looks at it. So anything that happens is, is like, he uses it as like, okay, that's a good thing that that happened because it's going to affect the other guy more than it affects me. Um, and which is a really unique way to look at it, I think, but, um, very effective. Yeah. And I also love just what he puts on his Twitter. It's, it's just very <laughs> unique. Pretty. Oh, hard. he's a good follow for <laughs> sure. Dude. <laughs> He tweeted something about, he was like, who, what is the name of like a male version of a Karen last night? I just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> also, <laughs> um, yeah, like people still comment on his tweets, like about the Masvidal thing. It's like, what oh, are yeah. people doing? What That's does he the... say about that? I mean, 
the thing is like you can't look at it um a lot of social media is going to be well a lot of life too is like i feel like the 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 two percent that's not the smartest they're probably at the low end of the the, the bottom two percent as far as <laughs> intelligence going. are usually the loudest and uh i think that a lot of people would like social media makes us pay attention to that 2% a little bit too much because they're posting all the time. And it's like, not always, right? But like the trolls and it just like the comments that the people that post the Mazabell needs, like we get it, right? But um, yeah, as far as just, he just ignores it, brushes it off. It does, he, he, like you said, he doesn't take himself too seriously. Um, but the, the, yeah, the, the, the 2% that's just the, dumbest is usually the loudest <laughs> yeah that's funny i started a petition on change.org to um get people to stop complaining about their personal lives on facebook you should tell them to check it out <laughs> maybe give it a that's share that's great <laughs> yeah i mean like if you if you adjust your perspective just the fact that if you live in america or you live in a, like a first world country like you have it pretty good yeah and then the man a lot of the things that i hear people complaining about it's almost like do you have nothing better to complain about because these seem like first world problems they seem like high class problems right um and sometimes i'll catch myself i'm like all right i'm complaining about something that's like a pretty high class problem i should just check myself Mm -hmm. um you know i'm not perfect but at the same time there's there's a lot of people that don't know they have a privileged mindset um you know that they're blaming someone else that oh they're they have it so great and it's like okay you have it pretty good too let's let's check yourself you know (laughs) do you listen to gary vaynerchuk at all oh yeah i like gary v he's got tons of energy i actually um i listened to someone that's similar to him was like a entrepreneur business advice kind of guy his name's andy frisella have you ever heard of him Mm mm-hmm uh, so he started a supplement company in St. Louis and then he, um, and a supplement store, and then he just expanded into more and more companies and invested all these different things. And now he works with entrepreneurs, um, directly, um, to help them scale their businesses into huge corporations. Right. And I listen to his podcast religiously. It's called MF CEO. And okay. now it's actually called real AF cause he felt like he'd he felt like he said everything he needed to say on the business topic. And now he wanted to talk about more cultural problems. Okay. Um, so real AF, it's a great listen, but that was my Bible when I started out um, in business and it gave me so much like knowledge base that, you know what I mean? Of, of like what, what I really needed to focus on, what I really needed to do. And um, yeah, I, I can't, I, like I said, I can't um, recommend that enough. If you like Gary V. Gary Vee is, to me, it's like a, 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 it's like a less quality Andy to me, just because Andy just says it. He says the F word a lot. He's like, his name, his podcast is literally MFC. Yeah. You know what the F stands for. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but he, he gives just such like concrete, like that's the way it should be. Don't focus on this, do that. And when I start like, the scale of my business and like the the things that I've been able to do, I really attribute most of it, if not all of it to that podcast. Is it more catered to an audience of people like me and you, I guess? Yeah, I think that, um, so one thing he says is he says it's an, it's an entrepreneurship podcast. Like it's under that category, but it's really like, you're the CEO of you, right? You personally. And And we're all like in charge of our own life and and in charge of our own, like what we have going on. So it's, it goes along that narrative where it's like, it doesn't, you don't need to be an entrepreneur. Ah, if I could talk entrepreneur to, um, to listen to it, it helps. Some podcasts are more, you know, business oriented, but others are just mindset, conceptual thinking. Um, it's a great listen. And then, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, I, I, like I said, you just can't give enough credit to him. What other, um, just like resources or people or books have kind of helped you in just like 
making your a life for yourself? That one's the biggest one. Um, I've gotten recently, I've gotten it more into audiobooks and, um, and I list, I still listen to that podcast. Right. But it's, um, that, that one's like training me to think, right. But now I'm, I'm reading, um, I say reading they're, they're all audiobooks. I'm dyslexic. So I, <laughs> I can't read, I can't read like big books or anything like that. So I'll go on a run or a morning walk and I'm going to listen to them every morning. And that's like my daily education for the day. Um, so I finished Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life. That one's really good. Um, and going back to what I was saying about Andy, like you are the CEO of you. Um, one of his rules is treat yourself like someone you'd be responsible for helping. So you wouldn't feed your dog terrible food. Why do you feed yourself terrible food? You wouldn't let your kid do unhealthy behavior. Why are you doing that behavior? So treating yourself just like really well and like a, like you're your biggest investment, um, you know, cause at the end of the day you are, and then once you treat yourself really well, you're able to treat other people really well and you're able to be more productive and think clearly and, and all that. Uh, so I, I recommend that book. Um, currently reading rich dad, poor dad, which is just helps you with, financial literacy, which they don't teach in school, which is so stupid. Yeah. Um, for real. Because a lot, a lot of people just live beyond their means. They spend too much money and all that. And, um, you know, they, I, I saved a bunch of money and I was actually able to go back to school and wrestle and put my business on hold. I didn't know this virus was going to happen. That kind of sucks. But I, I actually like saved up and was, was smart about, okay, I can keep all my expenses on my business alive and I can keep, you know, chugging if I have this and this go a certain way. And, and it, it helps you just kind of conceptualize, okay, if you have wealth, how do you use it? You have money, how do you use it? Um, so that's another good read. So that's, yeah, I like um, all those. I'll have to check some of them out. But you said like you like to listen to them on like a morning run or morning walk or whatever. Do you, yeah. have you had like a daily routine during quarantine that you followed? Uh, yeah. So, um, I actually love talking about this. <laughs> um, awesome. I read, um, I didn't read, listen to, uh, <laughs> something called the miracle morning, which is like, it's like the perfect morning routine. And so it talks about life savers. So silence, affirmation, visualization, exercise, reading and scribe so scribe is like writing down um and anything you want to like improve on you should record right um i heard that i can't remember where but it's it's really true so um every morning i have this journal like i basically write down five things i'm going to do for the day and then um you know a bunch of other stuff like daily quote of the day daily thought of the day the most important thing though i think on there is one incremental change I'm trying to implement in my life. So like morning walk. Well, first of it was keeping the journal, which was great because then 21 days, it's a habit. So then at first I was keeping the journal. Then I was like, okay, I'm going to keep the journal. I'm going to go on a morning walk and listen to an audiobook. Perfect. Now I got those two. And then I'm going to do those two. And now I'm going to make my bed every morning. Okay. Then I'm going to do those three. And then I'm going to make a video at the end of the walk um, kind of talking to myself about what I learned during the audiobook so that I internalize it better. And like one incremental change at a time, we try to like live this perfect life um, all at once. And then we kind of fall short because our habits are different things. But if you just change one thing at a time, then you can systematically create a better life for yourself and keep yourself more accountable and more disciplined and all of that. Um, so that's like my biggest morning routine is I wake up, I'll go for, I'll write in the journal, right? And then the five days, the five things I was gonna do yesterday, I go back a page and I read, okay, check, I did that one, I did that one. And if I don't do one of them, I write in like a little 100%, um, cause there's a book called Extreme Ownership where basically like everything is your responsibility. So if it was on my to-do list and I didn't do it, it doesn't matter. Coronavirus, hurricane, it was my responsibility to get it done. And if it didn't, then I'll write a little 100% to remind myself that 
that's on me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like a little bit of my morning routine, um, which I think is really important, like primes you for the day and gets you in a productive state of mind. Nice. That's Jacko's book. Is that right? Extreme ownership. Yeah. 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 I like, I like that one a lot. The basic, uh, like I said, the basic theme of it is doesn't matter. You're the leader of your life and everything in your life is your responsibility and in your control and uh, don't blame other people for your problems, basically. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of like the biggest things I got out of wrestling um, in college, as dumb as it sounds, it's so over J term, we do a ton of sprints every day. Um, and then like, so we did them the first time of the year or whatever all our legs were super sore and everyone was complaining about it. And then our coach was just like, Hey guys, just so you know, literally nobody cares. And it just kind of, it just kind of teaches you like, like why even complain about stuff that no one can change because no one cares. Like just, I don't know, just like take ownership for it. And a lot of times yeah. when I'm like, I don't know, complaining about stuff that I signed up to do, it's like, no one cares. You want to do this, just finish it. So. The the greatest thing about wrestling, the, the two greatest things is one, it's an individual sport. So it's all on you. There's not a whole lot of things you can blame, you know what I mean? Outside of yourself. Right. Um, and some would say there's nothing outside of yourself that you can blame. But the other thing is like, we, we work so hard and we have to be so disciplined in what we do. Um, and everyone around us is going through it. So while we're, the basketball team's not going through it. The baseball team's not going through it, but we're going through it. So we understand that there's a struggle. So you can complain to your teammates, but your teammates are going to be like, dude, I was right next to you in the sprints. I get it sucks. You know what I mean? What yeah. do you want me to say? Yeah, there's a, it's the definite attitude and like the way that wrestlers are brought up, you know, to, to think. And I think we definitely do think differently. And that's been really one of the coolest things about working with a lot of people in this field is like at a basic level, the, the people that are successful in this sport think a certain way and they, they act a certain way and they do it. They have a certain standard for themselves, which is very cool to see. Yeah. And like, that's another thing. It's tough being in, if you're doing like a group workout or something, if you're with somebody that's constantly complaining, like it's tough because everybody is like in pain or out of breath or whatever it's it doesn't help um telling everyone how much more out of breath you are or whatever yeah no it doesn't do anything <laughs> yeah um so going off of that i guess what i think like there's like the stigma of d3 wrestling that it's just like for people that aren't as good and that might be true but I also think that you get so much out of it and like it's really changed my life and who I am and my future goals. How has it impacted your life? Well, uh, it's obviously greatly impacted my life. I think that wrestling in college is probably the best decision I ever made. Um, I went on like 13 recruiting visits. My mom was really into me finding the right school and I'm so glad I went to Whitewater. I know you're from lacrosse, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, thanks, I couldn't... thanks for covering up your whitewater shirt with the mic by the way appreciate that, <laughs> Get that um no it's it, it was a great decision and I'm, I'm so glad i made it um I, i'll say that if you could just go by the numbers this is one thing that's overlooked when it comes to d3 d3 d2 wrestling is the, when you look at like the carryover to other to college sports from high school sports, the amount of participants to the amount of participants, right? Wrestling has the smallest percent of people that continue into college. So it's by that definition of statistics, the diff most difficult to continue into college, right? But if you look at the amount of people in other sports that continue at the D1 level, college wrestling is really all division one when it comes to like other sports. Do you know what I mean? Because the amount, the percent of people that, that continue to college wrestling at any level is about the same of people in other sports that continue at the D1 level. So it's like, it's interesting to see that there's like a stigma to it because that stigma is coming from other sports and other universities 
that, oh, that's a D3 school. You know what I mean? Like we would go D1. But when you look at the amount of participants and how difficult it is to wrestle in college, it's really like, it's almost like most of the programs that you see that are high level at D2, D, uh, D3, those could be D1 programs if you just look, look at the talent base coming from high school. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing is, man, I would take a two-time D2 champ or a two-time D3 champ over a D1 All-American in a match. Maybe a lower level. Like, uh, then maybe he doesn't take third. Maybe he takes, like, eighth. You know what I mean? But, like, I think I'm going to take the champ. Uh, and maybe they're, they're right on the same level. Maybe some go this way, some go that way. But uh, there's not as big of a jump that people think there is, you know what I mean? At the, at the base level, maybe at like, you know, a 500 starter at D1 is gonna smoke a 500 starter at D3 or D2. That is true. But when you look at the top level, um, wrestling's wrestling, the, the sport doesn't change. You know what I mean? And anybody mm -hmm. can beat anybody on the right day. Um, and style matchups and all that kind of stuff, It's it's interesting to see at opens for sure. Yeah. And I feel like the like stigma or whatever it is about D3 and D2 and any non D1 program is, I feel like it's been changing the last couple of years, maybe just because of social media, like kids get to see D3 stuff instead of just like what's on TV or whatever more mm -hmm. often, but yeah, absolutely. And then the other thing is, like, if you want to continue in college, like, wrestlers love wrestling. Um, it's hard to, to be a wrestler, work so hard for it, get all the benefits from it, and then not love it. So there are a lot of people that are like, okay, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep wrestling in college. And um, and I think that just knowing that they have that opportunity to do that, even if it's not a D1 level, um, it's it's a good thing. It's great. It was great for me. I know it's been great for you. So uh, it's, it's, it's something that we should continue to speak about and get the word out on. Were you surprised at how hard it was when you first got there? Um, yeah, I think that like, I worked really hard in, in high school, right? Um, I started wrestling when I was in eighth grade, so that's kind of late. Um, Me too. Really? Yeah. yeah. So it's like to, to get to a high level, you had to go to club practice a bunch. You had to work really, really hard on your own. You know what I mean? You had to, to sacrifice a lot of the other things. Whereas if we were wrestling since we've been five, we didn't have, we had to make up the gap at the, mm -hmm. the highest level. Right. So, um, so I worked really hard and I surrounded myself with people that wrestled in college also, you know, or, or went on to wrestle in college. Like our club was awesome, man. We had, one guy who was definitely good enough to go D1, but I, I, he went into the Army, never wrestled uh, in college. Another one wrestled at Maryville, high-level D2 school in Missouri. Another one at Mizzou. Another one in, was the starter at Indiana for a while. Um, another one at N, NIU. I mean, we, wow. we had like a – we had like a – we still have this group chat, dude. It's hilarious. Um, but, yeah, the Team St. Louis crew was like – we all trained together. and We held ourselves to a high standard. So I'm getting a little off topic. It was hard when I came in, but, and it was definitely a step up in workload and, and, and all that. Um, I was a little surprised on how hard it was, but I think I was prepared for it because of the base that I had of people that I had surrounded myself with in, uh, in high school. Okay. So yeah, I come from a school that went like one and nine in duels my senior year. <laughs> and usually I was one of the few people that won a match, but I guess like, and I, I was on the national team, so I like wrestled a lot of better people, I guess, but I was still uh -huh. a little star, not starstruck, shell-shocked, well, one of those words. Yeah, no, I not all those people were from my club team. My high school was pretty trash as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Like, those like 30 minute goes when you just can't get out of bottom those are the memories i'll have for the rest of my life <laughs> but, yeah those yeah. suck dude <laughs> no no yeah. two ways about it yeah <laughs> but then 
going forward um, after wrestling, what are those skills that it's kind of instilled in you that you'll carry on with you for the rest of your life? Wrestling has taught me work ethic. I think that there's a lot of other people that aren't wrestlers. I, I don't see them with the same type of like work and, and like focus and, and drive because to be good at wrestling, you have to wrestle a ton. You have to work a ton. You have to be on top of your strength, conditioning, your diet, your focus, your mental aspects, right? Everything has to be like on point. And so when you transfer all of that time and energy that you were spending on wrestling to another thing, you're setting yourself up into a really good structure of work and drive to make that thing really successful. Whereas I see people in the video industry and I have a lot of really hardworking friends, right? I'm not talking about them, but there are some people that are a little bit like lazy almost, you know, and, and it's like, if you really, really grind, like we've been taught to grind in wrestling, you could be successful in pretty much anything. Um, the, 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 cut off for some wrestlers unfortunately is that they don't attack other things the way they attack wrestling because it's e it's not easy to attack wrestling but we love it so we want to right we want to attack and get better because the benefits there we've seen how fun it is to be great at this sport um and how great this sport really can be but if you attack other things like that like your career you're setting yourself up for great success yeah and like yeah, I feel like a lot of people that win state in high school or maybe win an NCAA title, probably not that as much, but if you win a state title in high school, sometimes you just kind of coast in the rest of your life or whatever you're doing next. And for me, I'm glad I didn't reach my goals because it leaves me pissed off and ready to do more stuff. I, I definitely hear that. I definitely hear that. I think actually my plan going into the state tournament as crazy as this sounds was to win state and then like never wrestle again. I mean, I, I was going to go to Mizzou and I was going to study film and I wasn't going to wrestle in, in college. And I took third. Right. And I lost. I was so close. I lost by like two points to this dude. He's three time state champ, four time finalist wrestles in North Carolina. Dude was a stud. That? A Josh McClure. Okay. Yeah, dude's a stud, right? And great guy. I can't even talk bad about him, which is so annoying. <laughs> He's such a nice guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I, I feel you. Like I, I came short of what I really, really wanted, and that made me like, all right, I'm not done here. I got, I got more. You know what I mean? I got, I gotta, I gotta keep chasing this. So that, and then I also hear the other perspective. One of my friends won state, and then he wrestled in college, and he was kind of like. Yeah, I mean, like, he's a hard worker. Like, he's not going to not work hard, but he's kind of like the enthusiasm. Like, you could have snapped my neck on the podium is one thing he says. Like, I, I've never been that happy. I, I put in all this work, and I got the result I wanted. I was a state champion. I'm holding the bracket. Um, but he goes, in college, it's like, you know, you're starting over again, and so, some of that drive is lost when you lose state. Not always, but sometimes it really is. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I guess for me, I was honestly just really pumped that I qualified for state. So I had a little bit of that where I was like, okay, we just chilling now this summer, you know? <laughs> and yeah, the next year I started wrestling lacrosse and then quit like right before the season started. Um, huh. Then I had a little break and kind of like refound why I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's what? the real thing. Anytime you, um, I, I've never quit wrestling, but I guess I kind of have because after my sophomore year, I had elbow surgery, right? And then I displaced a bone in my elbow actually at, at WIAC conference, right? Championships. Oh. And it was mid match, I was up by like seven points, and I blew this lead and I lost by one point because one of my arms didn't work. <laughs> Who are you wrestling? Kid from Platteville. Oh God! I know. Just I hit this dirtiest. Oh, it, we're not even gonna talk about the match anyway. So, <laughs> but I also I needed shoulder surgery again. So this would be my second shoulder surgery on the same labrum. So now I've got like two shoulder surgeries on this one, and an elbow surgery, and I had to have those surgeries back to back. So I was like 
on painkillers for a long time. And those things make you depressed as hell when you come off of them. Um, and that was kind of the summer I was like, it's like, dude, I might never wrestle again. And then where, where am I going to put all this time and energy? I don't want to just go to the bars and do nothing with my life. So that's where I really started chasing um, video as a career. And I was like, okay, this is like, I'm going to really chase this down. I'm really going to throw everything into this. Like I threw everything into wrestling and yeah, the results were slow at first and then they picked up. And like I said, I got my big break. Um, and so that I look at that me walking away from the sport as like, I wanted to wrestle so bad and it hurt so bad that I like couldn't come back and compete because my body was so messed up. And, uh, and I was still feeling the effects of the surgeries and stuff and it hurt so bad. And I just used that as like a driving force for my career. But that was like the best thing that ever could have happened to me. You know what I mean? I mean, it really, it really was like, I could have wrestled two more years at school and I'm sure that I would have had some level of a success. I would have, you know, worked really, really hard and all that, but man, I would never, I, I'd be entering my career right now. And I wouldn't have had this great base and I wouldn't have had all of the experiences I've had up to this point. So it's like, I like to say when God closes a door, he opens a window. And I think that's uh that's what he did there. Yeah. Um, speaking of just making videos. So I used to be like really into skateboarding and me and all my friends would make a ton of like skating videos. Uh -huh. Um, I, I kind of want to get back into making videos like, what would you recommend someone starts with in terms of like software and a camera? Definitely. So the most people have like the DSLR that you would need. I mean, like if you, if you buy a camera, a what Canon DSLR? camera, it's a, I actually don't know what it stands for, but it's like, it's, it's like a camera that you would see, like, you know, you hold it like this, you have this, the, the lens detaches, right? Okay. Um, so a basic level, one of those will run you, I think I bought mine for like 700. So that's expensive, but in the grand scheme of the, like how much money you can make with it, it's not too expensive. Um, something like that would be great, but definitely edit on final cut pro. That's, I think that's that for costs, Mac, right? yeah, it's only okay. for Mac, but everyone will tell you, you use premiere. And they're like, oh, movies are made on Premiere. It's the industry standard. Dude, it's so slow and so boring to edit with that stuff. Like, I have a lot of fun editing with Final Cut. And, um, yeah, Premiere is like, it looks like I'm looking at something from the 1990s. And it's just, it's not fun and it's not user-friendly. And maybe you can do a bit more with the video, but it's just not worth it. Okay, so Final Cut Pro is the way to go. Final Cut Pro, and then you can use your, your phone. There are a lot of like little lenses you can attach the edge of your phone and just use your phone for stuff. Um, that's like, we have um, more technology in our phone camera than we did in Hollywood for years and years and years and years. So it's um, probably until like the turn of the century. So yeah, I would say using your phone is, is a great option. So I always see you at wrestling tournaments with your iPad. Is that right? iPad. Um, I think I have an iPad. Are you serious? Oh, <laughs> I, I don't know why. I thought you like carried around an iPad to film with. Maybe it's just. A well, camera. you're talking about like the, the gimbal. This, yeah. Yeah. So the, um, that's got, it holds my camera and then it's a stabilizer. And then you, oh. hold, you hold on to it and you could like turn it like a, like it's a car or something. I don't know. And you tilt down, tilt up and you could, you learn how to like maneuver it. That was, okay. a, yeah, oh, that God. was, that was a good investment buying that thing. It helped my production quality go from here to, you know, from here real quickly. It's just, okay. I learned how to use it. Mm -hmm. I must've forgotten my contacts that day or something. I don't know. <laughs> Well, you but, saw that. Saw... I mean, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, because that's definitely how I hold it. Like you would hold an iPhone or iPad. Okay. Um, but uh, it... oh, go on. It's... 
No, I was just gonna say it's one of my favorite toys. I, I call all my equipment toys, you know. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> Is that like fun. a must have for filming sports and that kind of stuff? You know, actually it's funny you say that. A lot of people who film sports will film on a tripod and it's actually like I've seen very few people maybe now a little bit more, but when I first started doing, you know, the gimbal is what it's called, the stabilizer. Um, I was, I think one of the only people in sports that used it, except for the, maybe, maybe the high level, super high level. Uh, but in wrestling, it just makes everything look like it, everything like comes alive. It makes it look like a movie because there's the cameras moving and the people are moving. So it gives it this really cool effect where if it's on a tripod, like we've all seen that before, you know what I mean? It's not like as cutting edge. Um, Plus in a wrestling tournament, like something like a D3 tournament, for instance, like some people might have uh, an iPad or a, or a tripod camera, right? And they're they're not really paying attention to where it is and they're not really like paying attention to the framing. Whereas like you have someone like me who's got the <laughs> camera gimbal and I'm being very specific about, you know, where I point it and the angles I get. It just, it's just a whole different thing. You know what I mean? And they're yeah. just fil filming the match. And for people that don't know, like, this dude, I'm not being a suck-up. This dude makes the dopest videos I've ever seen. Like, the dopest <laughs> sports highlight videos. I appreciate so, that. I think it's because, like, when you use the gimbal instead of the tripod, it makes you feel like you're kind of on the mat. Because it's, like, it doesn't make you feel like you're just watching from the stands. And it's it's super cool. Yeah, I think that... Well, so to start off, thank you for saying that. Um, no problem. It's it's a very fun job, and I, I I like to you know really get into it a lot. Um, I'd say that it hasn't been just like turn on. Okay, you're talented at video. I've been doing this for over ten years, right? Because I've been editing football videos since I was in seventh grade. So I've literally been making videos for longer than I've been wrestling, which is crazy to think. Um, but the, um, yeah, so like the 10 years of editing experience, just understanding how the software works and, and making it just like kind of an extension of my hands almost, um, is that just comes with experience, but then, uh, just learning a lot of different filmmaking techniques from Hollywood and stuff like that and putting them in the sports world where they're not as regularly used, um, that helped me a ton. And then just working really, really hard and, and having fun with the edits. Cause like you look at some music videos of like people dancing and they're like, look pretty cool. Cause they've got all these effects and, and the camera's changing and it's really well shot, well lit. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like look at that as like a little bit of inspiration of, okay, this is how cool I could make wrestling look. Cause if I'm doing it perfect, like if I'm really, really on my A game, and I do my absolute best work in my head, they should almost look like they're dancing to the music, right? So like everything is on beat, everything yeah. is crash and swing and you know what I mean? Like, cause there are all these different wrestling moves that you can kind of blend to different sounds in the soundtrack. And so you've got that line of sound and that's kind of like the roadmap where you can look at like, okay, this is a horn sound and like a, crash sound and like all these different things that you can like assign moves to the sound and then you can add some effects to it to make it look even cooler cool. if that makes any sense yeah <laughs> i no, don't totally. I, I can never tell <laughs> and i think if people watch your videos they'll understand what you're saying yeah like, yeah by just like putting everything to the beat of the music and that kind of stuff oh 100 percent. it's like um some people don't understand like that's like the roadmap like it all comes from the soundtrack the, the song you know you make the video to the song you don't make the song match the video so it's just that understanding of of the way that music videos and movies do it what are your thoughts on how everyone can do that um on tiktok but like obviously not as well and it's like five second videos um it's interesting the more people that get into editing as like a um hobby they'll get 
more into editing and filmmaking as a career. And so this, over the last, I want to say 10 years, the, um, and definitely the last five, just YouTubers and, and everyone that gets into making videos, the competition in the space just keeps getting more and more steep. And videographer is like a full-time job. Like I remember when I first got to college, there were professors like, oh, so you're going to do weddings? I'm like, no, I, I'm not going to do weddings. And they're like, you have to do weddings if you want to make it a full-time job. And I like that I've actually proved that wrong, but it's really, for years, that was the only full-time film job that you could get in like the Midwest without mm -hmm. going to New York or LA and doing like big, huge product shoots where now freelance videographer is just kind of like an accepted um, career choice. Are you planning on staying in Milwaukee for a while? Yeah, I think, um, so I'm definitely here for the next year. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity around here that I can definitely capitalize on. Um, some of my clients are here. Like I said, Ben's here. Um, Rufus Sport MMA that I want I want to work with them more and, and do a lot of stuff in pr promoting their fighters and just giving them high quality content um, to just promote themselves better. Like that's just one of the biggest things in MMA is like being able to draw an audience and draw a crowd. And a big way of doing that is quality media content. And then Whitewater is just there and they're one of my best clients and I can f fly to get to um, any gigs I have for West Point or track or drive to Iowa's not too far. Chicago's not too far. So there's some other things in the Midwest. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri is where I'm from. That's not too far. So I'm trying to get a couple more clients in St. Louis. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's Milwaukee or it's St. Louis going back home. Those are kind of like, I really wouldn't want to live anywhere besides those two. Man, I was just realizing how many things there are that we could talk about because you've done so much stuff. <laughs> because I wanted to, I guess I kind of want to know a little bit more about what it's like um, being at a UFC and walking out with Ben and all that kind of stuff. Okay, that, that was by far the craziest experience of my life because that's one of those things where it's like, I shouldn't be there. I should not be in Ben Askren's corner. You know what I mean? Like, um, it, it's like, it doesn't make, it doesn't make much sense. And, um, I'm not saying like, I'm not, it's just like, sometimes you work really, really hard at something and you're, you're getting something out of it that you didn't even anticipate. You know what I mean? Where like, mm -hmm. I did not, it, it's not like I started doing videos for Ben thinking, yeah, one day he'll put me in this corner. You know what I mean? It was just something that kind of happened and, and it was absolutely crazy. The, um, uh, I'll say that like the, just being on TV and having like people be like, John's literally on TV right now. Like we can't like my friends like to give me a lot of crap, right? We can't even give him crap for that. Cause it's cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, Except that, of course, I'm probably the least qualified UFC corner in history because I'm just a videographer for wrestling college. But, but um, it was crazy. The the fans just cheering right there. Um, of course, it sucks that, that Ben came away with the loss. Um, but just watching the fight from that close and having the energy in that arena, the build up to that, and Ben was the main event, so all the media obligations we went through, um, I've still got my, my sweatshirt that says Askren down the back. You know what I mean? Like the nice white UFC corner gear. That's sweet. Oh my God. It's so cool. It's like, it's like, I don't know whether it's like my J-Rob shirt. I don't know whether to wear it proudly or like frame it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, there's, there's I'd no in between. <laughs> right? There's no in between with that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I think that, like I said before, it's like sometimes you work really, really hard on something like my videos, right? Or your wrestling career or your podcast. And you think it's going to take you someplace amazing and it does, but it also takes you further than you thought it would or to some crazy opportunity that you just didn't see coming. Yeah. Cool. Um, I got 
a couple more questions. It's getting kind of long, but I, <laughs> I love it. We're just having a good so. conversation. Yeah, honestly, definitely. Yeah. Um, my next question is, who do you got, Dacre Burrows? No, I think any any way you slice it, it's going to be incredible to watch. I think two things. I think it's going to be close. I think that you can't really bet against Jordan just because he has such a track record of just every time you think he's going to lose and, oh, Taylor's got a big lead and, oh, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. He just has a way of coming back. He has a way of winning. Um, and he's just so good on his feet that it's it's crazy. Um, I can't bet against Jordan. I think it's going to be close. I think that if someone's going to beat – to unseed – Jordan for the Olympics is definitely going to be Dake. Um, Dake's defense is incredible. So it's really going to see, it's going to be like who wins it on the feet, obviously, because it's freestyle. But um, the other thing is if Jordan wins this match, he is the greatest wrestler of all time. And I don't think that you can really argue against that. I mean, John Smith has won more titles, but it's like John Smith won in an era where I, I'm a huge John Smith fan, right? But he won in an era where you can literally lose and still win a gold medal. And right now, the way that international wrestling is, is you can lose one match and you don't even have a chance for the third. It's not a true wrestle back, right? You have to lose to somebody who makes the finals to have that shot at third. And that's just not as good a system. And, and it's really, it's really weird because other countries have this single elimination mentality and they're like, well, it doesn't matter. We're, we're trying to figure out who the best wrestler is. We're, we're trying to worry about gold. And they're so focused on gold that it's like some of the best wrestling matches are on the backside of the bracket coming back for third place at the national tournament. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That backside, that true wrestleback is like, that's a great thing. And I don't think that we can just discount bronze as, well, you know, they, they took a bronze medal and let's give out two. Like, it should be a true yeah. third. So, um, but to a little off topic, but to get to your question, I think, I think Burroughs. Awesome. Um, and then my last question is how have you been able to balance all this stuff that you've done? Um, oof. Um, I think I'm really critical about myself. I don't think I do a very good job of balancing it. <laughs> but you do it all. <laughs> well, it you know, you know, like you could see, you could see like how, how basically phoned in I've been on wrestling jokes the last year, past two years, really. It's just like, I'm barely keeping it alive. I'm not spending a ton of time and effort on it. Um, it's difficult, but it's also, um, like I said, it's one incremental change at a time. It's, it's getting better and better at focusing and better and better at, um, is my TV on? That's annoying. I didn't know my TV was on. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's getting better and better at, at focusing like, okay, if you have five things you need to get done and you get all of five of those things done, great. That's, that's the day. But if you overload and you like, my mom's like, oh, I need four, I need to do 14 things today. And I'm like, mom, you're going to get done three. There's like just no way you can focus on 14 things and get 14 things done. So prioritizing and just, um, man, it's a, it's a lot of like long hours, to be honest. They, um, there's no nine to five when you go up to work for yourself. It's, it's, you have from you, when you wake up to when you go to bed and in college, in the college days, I'm not gonna lie. I've edited some videos drunk because I've come home from the bars and be like, let's put some hours in. How do they work out? <laughs> They're not bad. I'll make corrections hey. the next day. You know what I mean? Respect. <laughs> but the, yeah, no, it's, it's wild. College was really hard because like now I'm focusing school, which by the end I really didn't even care about. Cause I was like, if I'm in business for myself, who am I going to show my degree to? Yeah. Um, but yeah, just being, being on, on top of things and being disciplined in my approach for things. The morning routine helps a lot. And um, when I started out, I was not as good at this as I have gotten to be. You know, a lot of experience, 
learning from your mistakes and um, doing the wrong things and then hating that you've done the wrong things, blowing opportunities, and then just being like, okay, learn from that. You know, I'm still young in my career, so please don't make that mistake again. Learn from it and move on. Yeah, failing at things is very helpful, honestly. <laughs> Actually, I've got, okay, so I've got a theory that I've been working on, and I this is probably, it could be crap, I don't know. You might have to tell me. <laughs> Um, so, and it's a really easy wrestling analogy. I think that you have a certain amount of losses, like predetermined losses in life. So in wrestling, let's say you have, all right, you're going to lose 20 matches this year, right? Or you've got 20 matches you're going to lose. If you go to off season tournaments and you compete in freestyle and you do wrestling during the fall and you get those losses out of the way in the practice room and you get those losses out of the way in competition that doesn't really matter and you get the comp you know you get the losses out of the way all that experience and learning from your mistakes is going to come into the winter season where it really matters right and you're going to excel there because you've you've used all those losses up you know what i mean so i think that a lot of the risk and and mistakes that we make young, early in life and uh you know like the bumps and bruises that we learn from these losses, like we're getting them out of the way, we're learning from them. And then later down the line, we don't have to deal with them. Where if we don't do anything, we play it safe, down the line, we're gonna get burned by people who learn from their mistakes and they just, you know, mm -hmm. blaze past you. And you're gonna be like, oh, well, this isn't fair, I played it safe. But you didn't get your losses out of the way. So now you're, you have to deal with them now. Totally, I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, and then that's pretty much all I got for you. I want to ask where can people go to find your videos? Uh, so mostly, um, mostly my, my Instagram page is where I have the most like majority of them, uh, which is you like the letter underscore brought it on. Um, so that's a little play on my name. And then, uh, <laughs> nice. like you said, uh, Wrestling jokes is is another one of my pages. My YouTube channel got deleted when I was a junior in college, so I had a oh. like, I had a fair amount of subscribers. But when I was in middle school and high school, I broke copyright like all the time. <laughs> and uh, and then well, the final straw was I I got hired to do a video, and um, I made the video for a client. And then the client got a notification that I was like copying their video that I had posted. And they're like, yeah, he's stealing our, our footage. I was like, dude, I made the video for you. I'm just yeah. posting it on my YouTube channel. So that was the, unfortunately my third strike. Dang. I, I started a new YouTube channel, but I don't have a ton of stuff on there yet. So that's just my name, John Broughton. Okay. And the wrestling jokes is wrestling underscore jokes. If you want to <laughs> check it out, you got some you good got stuff it. on there. Thanks. I like repost yeah. reposting your stuff because you're like, <laughs> you've got like a more of a focus on the meme page and you're just like making funnier stuff, more relevant stuff, I feel like. So thanks for letting me repost your stuff <laughs> to stay I, relevant. I put more time into it because I don't know how to edit dope videos. So <laughs> I appreciate that. No problem. But hey, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for hopping on the podcast absolutely man let's uh let's do this again sometime we'll have you on uh on ugly or sometime yeah that'd be sweet yeah all right take sweet. it easy see you man